Welcome back to Manchester for another Pi Camera Library session. Uh, normal weather service has been resumed. It's raining. Never mind. Enough of weather reports. Let's have a look at the hardware that we're going to play with today. We haven't got the Pi 3 today. Instead, we've got a Pi Zero. And I'm going to pick this up rather gingerly because it's all hooked up here. At the top, you can just about see we've got a camera. That's a V2 module, so it's 8 megapixel. And it's all bundled together in this rather marvellous thing called a zero view from the Pi Hut, which has a couple of suckers on the front that allows it to attach to a window so that the Pi can watch the world outside. But we're not going to do that today. Let's stick it in the jaws here so that we can have a look through the camera's lens and see what it sees. When we do that, we're going to find that this camera sees the world slightly differently. So I'm just going to bring up our Pi desktop and uh, shrink the close-up here so that we can see both at the same time. Now I'm just going to use Raspberry Pi to fire up the uh, the camera's preview so we can see how it sees the world. Right, here's Minion Dave, very kindly knitted for us by a friend in America. Hello, Indy. And we can see that in the regular camera, he appears blue, but the Pi's camera is seeing him as rather pink or purple. And that's because this is a Pi Noir camera. It lacks an IR filter, so it's picking up lots and lots of near-infrared, which is why the scene looks a little washed out and why some of the colours appear a bit wrong. Let's have a look at what this actually means. Let's just stop the preview there. And uh, let's go and have a look at a graph courtesy of irphoto.net. This is a fantastic graph. It shows us the typical response curve of a CCD or CMOS camera, which is an example of... Uh, the Pi camera is an example of such a camera. The overall response curve is this black line here, and we've got wavelengths of light down the bottom. The visible spectrum is around about here, we're going from blue on the left to red on the right, and after that we're into the near-infrared. I stress we're into the near-infrared, that's not the far-infrared, which is the thermal zone. So if you're thinking that the Pi Noir camera is going to pick up heat, it's not. Uh, for that you need full-blown flare cameras and such like. So what we're talking about here is near-infrared, which is invisible to humans but has nothing to do with heat as such. It is the sort of infrared that's typically used in TV remote controls and the like. We've got several different curves here for the various elements of the Bayer filter. This is the thing that separates out the colours for the sensor. So here we've got the blue curve, which has a great big peak in the blue portion of the visible spectrum, as you'd expect, but also has this big hump over in the near-infrared. And then similarly for the green, and the red Bayer element obviously has a great big peak over in the visible red and then tapers off pretty slowly in the near infrared. So how come the regular Pi camera um, doesn't pick up all this near infrared? Well, the reason is that most normal cameras, not Pi Noir, but most the regular camera, has what's called a hot mirror, which is represented by this light blue line here. The hot mirror is responsible for filtering out ultraviolet and all this infrared. So it's limiting those curves by this blue curve here. The only difference with the Pi Noir camera is that it lacks this hot mirror. There is no electrical difference, there is no difference in the sensor, which also implies that you can't detect from the Pi whether or not you've got a regular camera module attached or a Pi Noir camera. As far as it's concerned, it's a camera. It doesn't know the difference. Uh, so yes, the only difference between these two types of camera is the lack of the hot mirror. So let's get back to the desktop. Today we're not going to play around with uh, scripting. Instead we're going to use the camera interactively from the command line. This is a great way of learning about the camera and learning how its various attributes interact and how the camera operates under regular conditions. It's also a really useful method for debugging. Now we could use Python 3 uh, and just fire up the command line like this. But actually, I'm going to use IPython3. Um, this isn't installed by default, so if you want to install this, you need to do sudo apt install IPython3, and this is just going to tell me that I've already got it installed, because I have. Oh, I forget how slow the <laughs> Pi0 is compared to the Pi3. So, IPython3 is a, an enhanced Python 3 environment, far more interactive that also includes interactive help facilities which we're going to find rather useful later on. Other than that it's just Python as you'd write in the script normally. 
it's got a slightly different prompt instead of having the, the three chevrons it's got in one and we'll see in two and so on but never mind the difference in the prompt it's still just python so let's import pi camera as we would usually and set up the camera by initializing it with pi camera remember capital p capital c so our camera is now active and at this point we can start the preview ah except now we've got a problem the preview has covered the desktop. How do I stop it? The preview system in the Pi camera is a relatively simple affair. It draws directly over the Pi's output. This means that the windowing system is unaware of the preview. It doesn't know that it's there. This also means that the windowing system can't interact with the preview. We can't use Alt-Tab to get back to our console. We can't move or resize the preview using the windowing system. So how do we stop it? Well, if you're confident in your typing, you can try blind typing camera.stoppreview. If you're less confident in your typing, then hit Control D. Control D uh, is the Unix way of saying end of file, and it terminates the, um, the Python process and brings you back to the command line. I think in the case of IPython, you need to hit Control D a couple of times because it annoyingly prompts you. But anyway, Control D is the simple way of getting out of this. Um, this is uh, also a problem in idle. Unfortunately, Control-D doesn't work in idle. Um, I think it's uh, Shift-F6 or something like that for resetting the shell in idle. So how do we avoid the preview taking up the whole desktop or, or so that we can see the desktop and, and stop the preview? There's various parameters that we can pass to start preview, including full screen, if I could possibly spell, equals false, and window, and here we give it a left top, width, and height coordinates. For this you do need to know the resolution of your desktop. I'm using 1280 by 720 so this is going to take up the top left quarter of the screen. So there's our preview at the top left. That's very useful. Another method which is probably more useful generally is to use the alpha keyword. Alpha is something we use in imaging formats to represent transparency. And it varies from 0, which is completely transparent, up to 255, which is completely opaque. So with this we can control the transparency of the preview. Let's go for a midway point, 128, and this, start, what am I doing? Start preview. This should give us a preview covering the desktop, which is partially transparent. So there we have our preview, but we can still see the command line behind it, which we can use to type camera.stoppreview. This is exceedingly useful both on the command line and when you're dealing with a script that you're not sure whether it will terminate. Uh, in that case, I would strongly recommend using alpha and a, a partial transparency value so that if anything goes wrong in your script and it doesn't finish and you're stuck with the preview, you can still control the environment that you're in and, and stop your script. So, there's various methods of debugging the preview. What else can we do with the camera? Well, in IPython, we can simply type camera dot then press tab and it should give us a list of all the attributes on the camera. This is fantastic. So there's all sorts of things that we can play with here. Uh, we probably recognize some of these. We've seen capture before. We've seen start recording, start preview. But we've also got several other things here. Brightness, contrast, um, saturation. So let's have a look at these. Uh, we can probably predict what they're going to do. But uh, for starters, let's, let's start the preview again. Now, I'm going to use the preview in the top left corner because it'll look a little better on the video and we can see the command line more clearly. We can query these attributes just by typing their name. So camera.brightness is currently 50. Um, what does the brightness vary between? Well, another useful aspect of the IPython shell here, we can place a question mark after an attribute and it will give us the documentation for that attribute. So here we go, retrieves or sets the brightness setting of the camera when queried, brightness probably blah, 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 blah. Level as an integer between zero and 100. Ah, the default is 50. Well, that's good. Let's press Q to get out of the help. So we should be able to set brightness to zero and presumably our preview will go black. It does. We can recall the previous and do 100 to make our preview white. Or we can use values in between to have a really blown out scene or a really dark scene or we can set it back to the regular. So that's brightness. Let's have a look at contrast. Hmm, contrast is zero. So that's probably got a different range. Again, let's try the question mark trick. There we go. When queried, contrast probably blah 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 blah. As an integer between minus 100 and 100. Okay, default value is zero. 
So, slightly different range for contrast. Let's try the extremes. Let's go to minus 100. That should give us something completely grey. It does. Or we could say minus 50 for something very, very dull. Or 100 for something really bright. All back to normal. Saturation, as it happens, is the same range, minus 100 to 100. We could do the question mark trick again, but let's just play with it. So that starts off at zero. We can set it to minus 100 for a completely black and white scene, like so. Or we can make it 100 for a very, very colourful scene. Oh, there's another interesting effect to the Pi Noir camera there, actually. Um, this speaker, to my eyes, looks completely black, but evidently the middle portion of it uh, gives out a fair amount of near infrared because it's appearing quite pink on the Pi camera, on the Pi Noir camera. So let's set saturation back to zero and go and have a look at some of the other attributes that we can play with. So let's have a look at AWB mode. AWB stands for Auto White Balance, and this is a mechanism used on most cameras to compensate for the illumination of your scene. So there's a difference in the, uh, well, let's say the quality of light that you get from uh, an artificial light source like a tungsten bulb or a fluorescent lamp, or for that matter, direct sunlight. Um, some are more yellow, some are more blue, so it's usually necessary to compensate for this in order to make the, the scene look in inverted commas, normal. So AWB mode starts off as auto. What other AWB modes can we possibly have? Uh, let's query it with a question mark. There we go, we've got off, auto, sunlight, cloudy. Uh, you have to ignore these, these back ticks. Um, all this sort of slightly strange markup is for the, the generation of the documentation in HTML. Um, but if you just ignore those bits, you can still see quite clearly what various options we have here. So tungsten would be a, a regular uh, light, and we've got fluorescent, incandescent, sunlight, cloudy, etc. etc. Let's, let's have a try with some of these. We're under relatively natural light here. I don't have any um, artificial light sources on at the moment. So let's try setting tungsten, which should make things a little different. Yes, there we go. Our, our preview is now rather more blue than it was before. And we set sunlight, we should presumably get, yeah, there we get something rather more yellow. And we can go back to auto, like so. So, any other interesting properties if I scroll up a bit? Ah, image effect is quite a fun one that we can play with. That's currently none. Let's query what we can use. Ooh, lots of things. So we can probably guess what some of these are going to do. Negative, that's probably fairly obvious. Pastel, colour swap I'm going to bet will swap the red and blue channels, usually leaving green. Uh, so let's give a few of these a try. Let's have a look. Let's try emboss. Ah, so that's rather grey and shows outlines of things. Let's try negative. Unsurprisingly, that's a, a negative image. And we've also, what else do we have? Cartoon. Uh, that's a, a rather posterized effect by the looks of things. And we had uh, Sketch was an odd one. Ah, oh, that's amusing. And Color Swap. And uh, yes, indeed, that does swap the red and blue channels. Something hand of is very blue. Set that back to none. Those image effects will not just affect the preview, but also any Im images that you capture. However, if I recall correctly, most of them don't work when recording video. I think the relatively simple ones like negative do, but uh, the rest like emboss and so on, I don't think work on recording video. Um, I have to experiment with that. So, going back to the list of attributes, uh, obviously V-Flip and, and H-Flip are very useful if your camera happens to be upside down. We can set V-Flip there and H-Flip uh, as well. That effectively gives us a fully rotated camera. We set them both back to false to bring us back there. Um, so I think that concludes our little tour of uh, of the camera interactively. Remember this is a, a very useful debugging. Oh, actually speaking of debugging, let's do one more attribute. Annotate text is a fantastically useful debugging attribute. This allows us to draw a simple line of text over the top of the preview and also captured images and video. So currently this is just a blank string. But we can set this to 
Hello World. Um, there's some text at the top of our preview. And there's a variety of additional attributes we can set, like text size, so we can blow that text up or make it very, very small. And you can update this as often as you like while your script is running. So if your preview does cover your uh, your screen entirely, this is a useful way of outputting some information about the state of your script uh, without having to uh, stick it in a log file and see it after your script's run. So annotate text is a wonderfully useful debugging tool, not to mention a useful status tool for general use in scripts anyway. So that concludes our tour of the camera from the command line interactively. Uh, as always, leave uh, um, any comments below. So tell me what you'd like to see in future videos. I think next time we'll probably get on to multiple captures and seeing if we can come up with a simple time-lapse script. Um, other than that, thanks for watching and goodbye.